we have Ann Palmau here. She is the owner of Sea Level Consulting, a cultural resource firm based here in Sitka since 2008. Her work includes the archaeological investigations and research of cultural sites as early as 8,000 years ago, documenting historic gold rush mining districts, World War II historic surveys, and anthropological investigations. So tonight, she'll be presenting on ancient fishing and mariculture structure discoveries within the intertidal zone of the Shikaquan territory. She'll discuss how new findings, along with greater application of ethnographic and oral history record, may lead to the consideration of other species, not just salmon, as target species. So why don't we put our hands together and welcome Anne for tonight's presentation. Thank you. I am an archaeologist. I've had my own company since 2008. Uh, but before that, I had the pleasure of working with the Forest Service. Um, that's how I got my I started here in Southeast. I had some really amazing um, supervisors and mentors there at the at the Forest Service. And um, I, uh, some of the sites I'll be sharing with you were um, discovered with them back in the day, in the early 2000s. Um, so yes, I am going to um, mostly talk about uh, fish weirs. I'm not sure. Um, there's so much to it. There's so much to archaeological sites. And one of my favorite uh, uh, sites or um, ancient fish ways of life are trapping fish in the intertidal zone. So I'm just going to share with you um, what some of those look like um, and then some newly discovered sites in this area. Um, yeah, so how have we fished? Uh, this photo, this is a, an amazing photo, is from the Sea Alaska Heritage Collection and those are all um, herring uh, spawns strung up here in Sitka. So it's pretty fun. Sure, thank you. Um, yep, so what are intertidal structures? Um, I'll go over that. discovered um, sites um, to add to that whole southeast inventory. And um, I have a colleague that was going to be here to um, go over some of the um, one site in particular that I just recently worked on, um, has a lot of local oral history with it. So hopefully he shows up and can share that with us. Um, and as you can see, sites are all over the world. So what are these intertidal structures? Well, they're um, Weirs, dams, obstructions uh, to gather fish. That when the the way it works, when the tide comes in, the fish follow up. Tide goes out. We've got some more fish coming up, <laughs> and then they get stuck there, and it's kind of easy pickings. <laughs> so this is just um, one. Uh, variety of, of a stone weir. This is a stone trap weir. Um, in the academic world, a lot of these uh, terms are interchangeable, whether it's a weir, whether it's a trap. Um, uh, the only thing that's pretty baskets that are a little bit different. But anyway, it's an obstruction. It's a dam. And there's a, oops a little uh, gap right there in the middle. Um, so a little bit about this gap. Um, in some of my research, I learned that this gap, not only can the fish swim through there, but as you can see in this illustration, it's, uh, it's blocked. Well, oftentimes, and as a conservation measure, this uh, material is, is removed, and so some of the fish are able to escape. Um, so where are these structures located in the intertidal zone? <laughs> uh, they can range anywhere from down here in the, the low water area um, all the way up into the uh, way upstream. Um, I love fish weirs. Uh, this is such they're just so, I just find them to be just such beautiful works of art and, and construction, and yet they're, they're functional. 
Um, yeah, this one is just a beautiful one in, in Taiwan. Um, so weirs, for the sake of this presentation, <laughs> we'll call, well, when we talk about weirs, we'll consider um, weirs that are made with wood stakes rather than uh, the stones. But as you can see here, there's, they come in all different shapes and <coughs> configurations, um, usually with uh, a gap in the middle where the fish can uh, swim in and escape. Sometimes, uh, like this, this heart-shaped one, it kind of leads the fish in, and then they just get pulled around inside. A lot of these round ones are uh, uh, depressions. So the fish get stuck in there um, as the tide goes out. So they have a little a pool and um, swim around and, and, and aren't prone to go out of, with the tide, of course. Um, this is a photo of George Edmund, Emmons. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with him. And, um, early days of southeast Alaska and he was especially stationed here in, in Sitka but uh, I'm not sure where this uh, where uh, was placed but it was somewhere in southeast Alaska circa 1900. So stone walls are another form of weirs and dams and obstructions where as uh, my movable graphic showed uh, the fish come in, get stuck behind here, and, and move on out. This one, this graphic, also may potentially be a clam garden. And I'll talk a little bit, I think I'll go through that next or so. Um, the stone weirs come in different shapes and configurations, and like I said too, usually they have a depression to uh, form a pool so that the, the fish can get stuck in there. Um, so another form in, of, of structure in the intertidal zone is using these uh, fish baskets. Um, they're down here. Well, they can be anywhere from all the way up to the riverine down to the, the estuary. Um, this, I'm not sure if you guys remember or heard about this Montana Creek find over there in Juneau. This is the original uh, basket that they found and this is a replica done by Steve Heinrichsen. Um, just beautiful, beautiful pieces, you know. Um, I just liked this big photo. This is, these baskets are huge and these are from the Yurok um, people that are on the very northern tip of today California in that area but on the coast of course so clam gardens uh, usually have uh, structures that kind of have this uh, rock wall along um, you know close to the the lower tide um, inside here uh, clams can be cultivated so here, this is a, a, a great picture. The, this one is uh, down in Canada. Um, Canada and the, the coast of British Columbia, they are just doing some amazing, amazing research. Um, we've done some up here, but um, we're just kind of limited to a lot of what the Forest Service does or, you know, by environmental compliance projects. Um, in Canada, the universities, well, and up north, the universities are pretty involved in archaeological sites, but um, in southeast, we're kind of a little bit alone here. Um, Canada has got so much archaeology going on and finding some amazing, amazing stuff. Um, so yeah, you can see the, the rock walls here kind of go down and around this clam garden. Uh, like I said, these um, these structures are all over the world, and they've been all over the world for thousands of years. This one, I, on a whim, took a trip to Tahiti because I found a $300 ticket out of LA, <laughs> used air miles to get to LA. And so when I got to, um, and then actually my supervisor at the Forest Service, the archeologist Pat Bauer was his name, um, wonderful person, but he said, go to Huahini. So um, 
which is another island near Tahiti. And um, I get there, and there's just these beautiful um, kind of V-shaped traps. Um, yep, they're all over. This one's in the, the Northwest Territory of Canada, the Inuit. This is, a, do I have the date on that? Yeah, 1930 photo. Um, but a lot of harvesting going on there uh, in Virginia. Virginia, Mississippi, all along the East Coast, especially up in Maine. Um, yeah, the shrews everywhere. So um, in my work, uh, I concentrate on our northern, we call it the northern northwest coast um, population. It's just a, a little bit different, you know, ways of life than the interior, of course, because we're out um, by the ocean, and so we're gathering those resources rather than inland getting bison or something. Um, but uh, what we have learned so far is uh, through the archaeological record, um, we have a few periods of occupation that we've narrowed it down to. Uh, this early period from 10,000 to 5,000 years ago is, is um, a, a time where people were uh, just, you know, starting to get to this area. Um, you know, deglaciation just happened, and uh, so people are moving in. In this period, the middle period, this is when we find people settling down a lot more and a lot of fish weirs and uh, intertidal structures beginning to, um, to, to come on the site or come in, into effect in the northwest coast. Um, these later years, uh, some of the, you know, with the influence of uh, historical uh, folks coming up, they're, the kind of changes a little bit, the weirs change a little, but um, they're still practicing quite a bit. Um, in, and the, the weirs get quite sophisticated in this later period. Um, so yeah, part of the northwest coast, this is in Oregon. Um, so these are all weir stakes. Uh, there's, a, of course, a grad student that counted every single one of them and um, mapped every single one of them. Uh, it's a beautiful site down there. Uh, let's see. This is uh, this in Canada off the coast of Vancouver. Um, this Cummings Harbor uh, fish site, this is only one uh, or two features of this whole entire complex. This is um, got so many structures going on, so much like shapes and it's, um, you know, as you can see, there's just a lot of, and it takes up a lot of area. It's, um, and it's been there for a long time, from 1270 to 380, they're getting dates. So it's been built up, it's been maintained, um, but this is just a, a pretty massive site and so we term it a complex. Um, um, yeah, this is Hiltzuk, and that's also on the, um, the uh, British Columbia coast. This you may have heard in the last, this uh, site in this area you may have heard about in the last um, year or so. Um, they made some amazing discoveries down there um, dating to 14,000 years old or years ago. And these came from the present. A, a radiocarbon dating thing rather than BC. We don't use that. Um, so we kind of do this calculation based on carbon theories and whatnot, and so we use uh, before present, so years before today. And then the years are kind of a little bit construed too, so that's why we kind of um, we do a calibrated and try to make it more understandable like a years like a calendar year before present. Um, but this is also uh, a very, very uh, amazing, unique site. There's so much going on uh, here. They've, they've found uh, a village. They've found um, all these wonderful, beautiful uh, wood points and um, 
they learned of this place because 14,000 years ago, so you might be thinking, wasn't there ice there? <laughs> well, according to the oral history of the Ihiltsuk people, um, there was a strip of land that was ice free and a lot of people uh, took refuge there and um, so it could be why the site's so big um, but yeah it's uh, and then the gentleman this gentleman um, Elroy White he's uh, he's of the and doing all this work and and very very good close relations with the, the First Nations people and I'm very involved in, in all of this work. So let's get to southern southeast Alaska. I say southern because it doesn't include Yakutat in this map. So the last uh, inventory of uh, known uh, fish traps, intertidal structures, was collected by Jane Smith in 2011. Uh, she's a fourth archaeologist, and so she uh, had a I, I really uh, do think that Prince of Wales was a majorly, majorly populated island. We know from um, some paleo shoreline and uh, deglaciation information that, yes, there may have been um, older sites and, and refuges where people can go. But uh, a lot of this data might be uh, skewed because there's not as much archaeology by the Forest Service, by consultants, by others, you know, up in this area, like in Chichigoff, or um, we did have you know, some big timber sales, like in the 80s, where um, there was quite a bit of survey done, um, but there's a lot going on to prompt that sort of investigation um, down in the Prince of Wales and in this area, um, perhaps. <laughs> Perhaps they have looked in here and there's nothing there, but um, I think there just might be. Um, so in the next few slides, and uh, I'm going to share with you some sites on Baranoff Island. And I used this amazing uh, website uh, put together by NOAA, um, the Alaska Shore Zone. It... Um, it has this, it has, they've mapped all, all the shoreline of, well, I actually don't know the extent. I know it's all of southeast Alaska, but this line right here is their video just going through. So you can watch these videos over here of the shoreline, and it's at super, super low tide. Um, and then all these blue dots are uh, the photos. So um, it's just a, an excellent tool that I just wanted to share with everyone and um, forever. Maybe you can find a good clam spot <laughs> later on from this. Uh, okay, so before we get to Baranoff Island, I guess I wanted to share this one, which was not part of the record. I had the opportunity to work in, on uh, Prince of Wales um, in the El Capitan Creek Passage area. Um, so this... Uh, this is an aerial photo. As you can see, there's all these pools, pools and channels, pools and channels. Uh, and I, I looked at this site before I went down there to do this work. Um, so these kind of a little bit lighter, it kind of helps out. It is suspected that these areas might have been where uh, the stakes and this is a weir, uh, um, a wood stake um, fish here. Well, it, it could be more. I mean, we haven't uh, completely inve investigated it, but I did find uh, several stakes laying on the ground there <laughs> or um, in the tidal flat. But, uh, yeah, when the 
after, you know, it's not being maintained. It's an ancient weir. So when the tide comes up and goes out, it's having this effect. It's kind of, you know, the, the top part of the stakes that aren't in the water being um, protected are breaking off. Sediment is building up and backing up. So you can see these berms are forming right here. So um, potentially, you know, you might be able to do an excavation and see if that actually is true. But um, the channels and everything are really amazing. There's one stake that we um, found on the ground there, which I don't believe that was in situ. It wasn't in the ground. We didn't pull it out. It But it's just amazing when you start seeing stuff, um, or you, you, you start to get a, a sense of what you're looking for, you can see this stuff everywhere, you know, on this shoreline mapping. Um, so during this project, I just wanted to share this fun bit really quick. Um, I worked with Jim Bachtel at the U.S. Forest Service down there, the geologist, and he's working a lot on uh, predictive modeling. Um, so uh, modeling of older shorelines, shorelines that are now at a higher elevation because of isostatic rebound and other, uh, Prince of Wales has a lot of geologic stuff going on. There's like this four bulge that's making the islands move up and down and, and all kinds of stuff. But basically, shorelines, well, you know, archaeological sites, for the most part, uh, the majority of them, uh, there's a high probability of them, are within 100 feet of um, shoreline. So if we kind of get an idea of what the shoreline was uh, thousands of years ago, that's where we can go look for some sites at a higher elevation. So that's exactly what we did. This is, uh, and, and this was just, it wasn't a major excavation dig, anything like that. This was just an initial survey. Um, this was private land. Uh, um, the mining company was looking at doing some mitigation um, for, you know, their mining and so they were looking to restore some of the other lands that had been disturbed by uh, timber harvest. So um, we just went in to do a, an initial assessment. Um, so, yeah, it's, oh, and so we went by this road, uh, see right here, we kind of have an idea, Jim and Risa Carlson down there on Prince of Wales, they've been testing this model and realizing, you know, the, the points of where they're finding these uh, paleo shorelines and sites. They find the shorelines based on raised marine shell beds for the most part. Um, so this one right here, this 18 meter line, is kind of right by the road. So we went up through the woods, which had been quite disturbed from all kinds of activity. You know, there's, it's always, people continue to use the land. <laughs> um, so we went up on this road right here um, where we knew that there was going to be a cut bank and whatnot and investigated that a little bit. And sure enough, we found some, we found rhyolite and amethyst, which was super pretty and fun, uh, this really pretty chert plate. Oh, and actually we have it now too, the chert one, because this was private land. Uh, the other artifact they gave to the Forest Service for their collection and their, um, their research, but uh, this one is a rhyolite flake. A flake is uh, a, a piece of rock that once you, so if you go to make a, a tool, a, projectile point or whatever, you hit it with uh, another rock and it flakes off. <laughs> so these are the evidence. And it, it kind of, you can see there's uh, characteristics to let me know that it's not just another rock in the dirt. There's um, these, we call them bolts of forest. Um, the other side, there's uh, 
dorsal ventral face, you know, we can, um, we, we can understand what these, that these pieces are actual lithic flakes from somebody making a tool. The obsidian I should share um, was, uh, there, uh, there's been a lot of studies going on to find out the source of this obsidian. Uh, one is uh, Sumas Island down there, and I just heard from some fishermen, have you looked in Rocky Pass? There's a bunch of obsidian there. And so we're like, all right, we'll let <laughs> Jim Bachtel know. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, now let's get to uh, Baranoff Island and this outer coast of the uh, Shiatika Klan territory. This is where I live and work, so this is, is my emphasis of, of study. Um, typically, <coughs> the, the territory travels up a little bit further into Chichikov Island. Um, then I, I did, when I worked for the Forest Service, I did go up there and, and um, we did uh, look for sites. I didn't know, there's one weir site up in the Fort Arm area, but um, for this lecture, I'm just going to focus on our area and, and, and Baranoff Island. Um, so these are the sites that I'm going to chat about. So this one, these two are in that uh, 2011 inventory. Um, these two are not. I'm saving those for the last. They're my favorite. And uh, these, I think two of them are in the inventory, and these are very much in the inventory. What inventory? Right, good question. Thank you. Um, so um, there is a big state record. It's called the Alaska Heritage Resources Survey Database. So whenever us archaeologists or actually anyone can call up the, the state office and say, hey, I found this, and um, we'll, they'll make a record of it. So then we have a catalog of, uh, of, of sites mm -hmm. in all of Alaska. Um, so this is just a little chart about those, um, what we find at those sites, and I'll uh, go through each one too. Um, yeah, so the first one up in Nakatina area, I have been up there recently, and the stream is actually eroding quite a bit. So um, the more uh, we're uh, stakes are being exposed. Oh. Yeah. So this is a shoreline. You can you could tell that the the river is cutting through it. Um, and I think a lot of this activity happened during our our landslide events. Um, here's a a, a stake. Um, oftentimes with these stakes, because they did. Um, use uh, fish weirs moved into the historical period too um, after contact and so we look at how this is uh, uh, not flaked off but uh, you know chopped off you know is it with an ads an ads is more like on a tool like this so you poke at it like this so it'd be a straight across um, marking an axe perhaps might be a side marking. So there's a lot going on here. It's a, a beautiful site. Um, there is a lot of shell middens. Shell middens are an indication that people were perhaps uh, more than just harvesting but living there. Um, and then this shell midden goes all the way up into the river, so it's quite extensive, and this could be quite a big site. Um, this is pie rock alignment. Now, I couldn't find the alignment, but this is in the record. Um, I have the aerial photo anyway, so if anybody can spot it, <laughs> let me know. Um, yeah, it, it's it's part of the record, but we and and often that happens, you know, things 
move and change. It could be covered up by another uh, for the river activity or whatnot, but could be there. However, right next to it, uh, around the corner, are these canoe haul outs. And um, I remember when uh, Brendan was doing his presentation for the park here, we looked at that slide and was like, oh, there's one. <laughs> so once you see them, you can just, and then a giant canoe. No, everybody knows that. <laughs> um, so moving down that uh, initial map that I showed you, uh, we're now south of town, because um, I'm skipping the two special ones, my two favorites. Uh, this is, yeah, this is just right south of town. When I first started doing archaeology here, I'm like, oh, everything's already been discovered. And, <laughs> and then I went in there, I'm like, oh my god, there's one, there's one. Um, and actually, I think we were flying in a, in a plane at really low, low tide, and I looked down, and I was like, awesome. And so I went and got my supervisor at the Forest Service, and he's like, well, let's go out there and record it. So um, there's this, and, and I think this shoreline mapping is updated, and so we were out there in 2004. I think this is a newer um, uh, image. So... The actual uh, weir is a stone weir that crosses somewhere in here. But look at what all this is right here. What is that? <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, 2004, I just had this little horrible camera. <laughs> um, but yeah, this rock alignment goes all the way across. There's the gap in the middle. It's a little bit better photo of that. And then, you know, we do our due diligence of survey and wander around in the woods. We use uh, soil probes to probe down looking for shell middens and whatnot. And uh, this is, it's not just a bundle of sticks, it's uh, a kind of a depression. So we might assume that perhaps this was, you know, where um, they processed fish or um, some, some order. So it, it's not a very big depression, so, um, but yeah, more investigation is needed. Um, this is another neat one. It's kind of hard to see this guy, too. There it is. <laughs> so this is just a little stone structure. Over uh, past uh, around the, so this is like way back in the bay. Around this corner right here, there are some canoe haul outs. Um, yeah, this is a close up of it. You can see it better from a little close up. And yeah, that's another depression in the woods. That's not a very good picture, but thought to throw that in there. This is, we're, going, we're continuing south on Baranoff. This is also one of my most favorite sites. It's just so perfect. This is super, super low tide, and you can see this really long, long canoe haul out. And then right here is one alignment. There's the gap, and then there's the other half of the alignment that goes across the, the stream there. So we don't have uh, radiocarbon dates for, for these. Um, this is it close up. It's just so perfect. <laughs> um, there's some uh, new testing uh, going on to um, date sites from, let me see how to explain this. The, so the rock has been, if it's placed there at a certain time, um, some colleagues and especially uh, some folks down in Oregon are doing this technique where they are taking uh, big giant uh, tar black tarps, making sure that there's no light, and then they, they lift the bottom of these rocks and they're, they're, they're somehow dating from underneath the rocks, that the part, the portions that have not been exposed to the air. Um, 
So, and that's a pretty new technique, and you know, it's pretty experimental, but um, they've got some good results from it, and um, that's what I'm hoping to do at some point up here. Um, this is that can you haul out, that perfect, perfect haul out. <laughs> Uh, port banks. Uh, well, let me just tell you that we did go um, up here and did some soil probing, and, and sure enough, there was some shell. Um, it was really, really hard to get through that first layer of rock of, of beach gravels because the beach, um, you know, terraces raise and all kinds of stuff goes on. So you have to just get through that um, rock and just keep pushing your probe down. But we did manage to. Um, find some shell, so, which I guess we didn't get dated. Um, this is Port Banks. I poked around here too, didn't really see the wear, but you can see, you know, there's some stuff going on here. What is that? What is, you know, some of these, there's a, a pool right there. There's, this is like pretty angular right in here too. A lot of these places, of course, you know, through the years have been uh, altered historically, altered through natural events. So, you know, we just slowly put the pieces together. Um, I think this is Port Banks, too, just kind of trying to get a, see if we see anything. <laughs> This uh, site you're probably all familiar with down at Redfish, um, kind of a special place. Um, this is where the, uh, the hemlock basket was found. Um, let's see. Yeah, and this is a landslide activity that came down and kind of exposed some things and whatnot. So, yeah, so the basket itself was dated to uh, 4,500, so we'll calibrate it at 3,350. Um, what was interesting was that it was hemlock. They did, uh, I don't know, this is still in here, but they did determine that it was hemlock, not spruce. Uh, and actually, I have a excerpt from Irene and Jimmy that I thought that I'd just play really quick from that Jupox series that the University of Alaska Fairbanks has. Um, I just loved hearing what she had to say about that. Uh, the raw materials. I guess it's not. not something you can go down the store and buy. I guess you can't hear it. Can you hear it? Also on basketry, um, long ago, we did material that was in our environment. And now uh, they discovered this one basket that's in Redfish Bay, that's hemlock. I get to thinking, why hemlock? When our people were known so well for spruce roots. The only uh, town community that may have been the wood product that was in the environment, so they used that. Or it may have been um, hemlock, is very strong material. So I gather, just assuming they used this uh, basket they had out there for, for um, maybe packing fish, so it had to be sturdy and strong. The only reason I mention this is um, after that generation, they um, start using spruce reps, which was available at that time. And I get sit and thought, now why is that available then and it's not available now? Because of the terrain. Um, I understand during, during the time when the Russians were here, they cut down a lot of trees. So therefore, new trees grew up, and the young new trees are what the women collect in the restaurant. Okay, now we move to the current generation. The terrain is not uh, acceptable for roots. It would be too um, crooked, too rocky. So now our local girls are working with cedar bark.
Yeah, you know, it's just love that little excerpt. Um, I also asked Terry Rothgar about that basket because um, it's it's just pretty special. Uh, there was resin found in the the bottom of it, um, salmon uh, residue, I should say. Um, and Terry mentioned that that was a common thing to um, take eggs, uh, fish eggs, and put them in baskets and bury them and, and let them ferment. Um, so perhaps somebody forgot about their basket. Um, For what purpose? Eating. Delicacy. <laughs> As the Norwegians. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is my favorite site. <laughs> um, it is right under our nose. Has anyone seen this? At low, low tide? Lisa? <laughs> yeah. Um, this, it, it's just so beautiful. Um, there's so many things about this place, uh, so many questions that I personally am still, you know, conducting the research. Uh, I need to collect and talk to more um, folks uh, about this, native folks that would know um, about the area. Um, these you might suspect as haulouts, but they're not because the 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 haulouts that I showed you before are. Uh, go all the way to the water. The, these are blocked. These are walls right here. This is a wall. This is a wall. Um, this area in here, there's a lot of mussels and clams and, and whatnot going on. <coughs> um, this down here, you can see this alignment right here. Than, and the gap. Uh, I wondered perhaps there was a different course for this stream that comes out here, right? There's a culvert right here. But with this development up here, perhaps it moved it and, you know, it's, it doesn't come down where it, it naturally did initially. There's another alignment right here and right here, pretty long. Right there, there's this diamond-shaped depression. I don't know what it is used for. What's the target fish? I'm looking into herring, the clams. Um, this is a typical salmon weir. Our, I would say that our academic record, and especially you see all those weirs down on Prince of Wales and in the lower uh, southeast, is a little bit biased towards salmon. Salmon is always the, <laughs> um, the, the, I don't know, it's just, you know, it's got to be salmon. That's the, that's the default. But, um, you know, more research is being done in this area. They're going back through, uh, well, mostly uh, led by Madonna Moss, who's out of the University of Oregon. She's going back through some older collections from archaeological sites, and she is finding a lot more herringbone, and uh, if not more herringbone than salmon in certain areas. And that's, of course, in our immediate area. Um, local people already know this, you know, that, um, you know, this is still probably, the, or is a place we see the, the herring spawn come up here. So it could be a multi-use um, site. There's the, maybe they were collecting salmon through this one and they got some clams here. Maybe the herring came through and got trapped in here. I don't know yet, but it's just geographically just beautiful. Whoops, uh, there's a little map, and I forgot to do the little uh, stone weir down here, which actually that stone weir could be older than these other uh, features. 
So that's why I'd like to do that uh, technique that they're, the, the gals down in Oregon are uh, working on with the big <laughs> tarps, <laughs> making sure not light. So here's that, that de depression right here. This is quite a long alignment. What's interesting too is some of these rocks are really, really big. So was there influence? Did this, did this site, uh, you know, with this little uh, stone alignment right here that's typical of, the, uh, of a salmon uh, catch, um, was that way older than some of this stuff in here? When they were building the development up here, did they ask for a few rocks and <laughs> helped them build their walls up again? Uh, you know, these sites are maintained. They're maintained for thousands of years. Uh, yeah, so here's one of those square. Look at this big rock right here. <laughs> And this is super, super low tide. Um, here's this, uh, that, that diamond shaped depression right here. So it could be targeting a, a multitude of species. Not quite sure yet, but I love it. Um, and in trying to figure this out, this um, gentleman, Gregory Monks, down in, on, in BC, he has uh, deduced that this uh, site is a, a herring trap. It's not quite the same configurations. Uh, we've got this right here, this kind of wall. But um, yeah, so I'm just trying to find some other sites and research that you know might give us clues. Um, and then also need to work with the, the people. Um, so, yeah, here we are at Stargavin. Beautiful place here. Um, some of these pools right here, this is not natural. This was done with excavators when they were building this road. <laughs> this right here, I, uh, I got an old uh, uh, photo from the Forest Service from one from 29. This is not here either. So I'm thinking that it was put in there to, uh, you know, a, a allow the stream to, to, to backfill a little bit um, and need it instead of, you know, flooding the, the road there. Um, this is the map of, the, of, of a weir down at, at Star Gavin Creek. Right here we have all these rock alignments in here are all kinds of weir stakes. The stakes go on further. Let's see if I got the other side. Yeah. So the stakes go on further down the line here. It's just what's left, though. You know, we can't make out a shape uh, because the river has already taken out everything else. This could, be, this could have been just as sophisticated as what was down on Prince of Wales. Uh, before the, you know the road was there and constrained it before the you know stream there's a lot of logging um, um, in the, the late 60s early 70s up the Star Gavin Valley which probably pushed a lot of stuff out I did learn that um, the, the the logging company did use the estuary to load the logs and whatnot so it, it's been altered quite a bit so this is what's remaining. Um, and it's kind of fun to see uh, how these rocks were placed in between the stakes. So um, on some of the other alignments, perhaps, you know, the, there were stakes, but the stakes are gone now. That's just a pretty stake sticking out of them. <laughs> there. Um, so on this project, we did uh, a few test excavations, and what we came up with was uh, this very, very dark, greasy material. 
um, and some fire cracked rock and, uh, and charcoal. The, the material is dark from the charcoal, but it was really greasy. So my colleague, uh, Holly McKinney, she's like, this is exactly what we saw up at Upper Sun River. Um, Upper Sun River is a really special site up in the interior um, where they've, they've found the oldest human remains in Alaska dating to like 14,200 or something like that. But they also found um, a lot of uh, uh, material that they, whoops, that they uh, did uh, um, isotopic testing. So isotopic testing is when we're looking for, um, looking at the, the salmon oils, the lipids in the oils. So we took some, some samples and sent it down to Arizona and sure enough, it was salmon. Um, can you guess which variety, <laughs> which species? What goes up um, Star Gavin Creek? Coho. So it was coho. So this Upper Sun River is just a, a, such a great job of um, um, uh, compiling data to give us these these markers, the lipid markers, and and uh, let us know what. So yeah, in the Star Gavin Valley, we also had Jim Bachel create a model for us, and here, which is interesting, in in the Sika and uh, Baranoff Island in this area, our uh, our islands haven't bounced back as much as Prince of Wales. So um, we looked along the shoreline here in these red hot areas where we predicted we might find uh, a, another shoreline and we found the, the clam or the yeah the clams that do indicate this was an ancient shoreline. We dated these clams and um, came back at 52, 5400 years ago. But it's right down there by the water. So um, I think, did I say or show you the weir stake? Yeah, oh, okay, yeah. So we had one of these uh, weir stakes. We took a little, uh, small little piece of it and had that radiocarbon dated and it came back as uh, from 16 to 1702, years before present. <laughs> Um, another love of mine, <laughs> this is like all the archaeological stuff I love, <laughs> um, are culturally modified trees. Uh, um, and usually by these weirs, you do find these markers. I've been uh, working with a forester <laughs> and um, trying to come up with a method of dating these trees. Um, through tree ring dating, I should have, I, I have a graphic and I didn't put it in there, but um, <coughs> when a tree is, uh, when bark is removed, when it's impacted, um, it affects the tree, the tree kind of like, it, it, I, would, I would say it's kind of a shock, um, and it, in general, uh, loses 30% of its nutrients. So its growth rings get really, really small until it starts healing again, and then they get bigger. So I've been coring these trees um, and collecting this data through my work um, just to uh, compile this assessment of dating trees, like counting back to where that really, really small uh, ring, uh, ring, well, there's a couple rings um, in there where that those rings are and then again it, the the rings are a little bit bigger so counting those rings up until the small ones and um, trying to extract a date from that i'm actually trying to i did this little experiment i had a a project um, out catlian bay and there's several uh we call this uh, culturally modified tree, a blaze mark, um, like blazing a trail, a marker for something. That's why we find them next to weirs. Um, there's a bunch along 
uh, in just off Star Gavin when you keep going up into the woods. This also coincides with some of the um, oral history accounts of where the Clinket people, uh, when they, they left the fort here, um, took that route. There's uh, another idea that they took a route along Nakosina, but um, one of the, the potential routes was through that uh, past Halibut Road and up in the, the woods right in there. So we found a whole bunch of culturally modified trees with blaze marks. Well, I um, did some coring, counted the rings, and it dates back to that time period when they would have um, left the fort here and moved on. But that is all just theory right now, <laughs> still working on all that. Um, and then I think I, yeah, I put some, uh, the dates that we got for this one is, this one's the, the charcoal from um, the, uh, and also where the, the lipid sample came from, these two. And then this one is, yep, that wood steak. And this one's the raised marine shell. Um, raised marine shell is a little bit different. It's still open and it's still in the growth position. So that's how you can kind of identify it more than just a, a shell on the beach. Oh, where did that come from? Maybe I was going to show that graphic again. I don't know. Oh, I guess I was. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you. I'm not sure if my friend Cricket is here in the audience. He was going to talk a little bit about Star Gavin and just his relation to his, his family out there. I'll just share really quick with you. Um, uh, Cricket's family, uh, his grandmother, uh, Anna Hunter, was out there at Star Gavin uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, she has relation to Cat Leanne. I, I can't really um, speak to the whole thing but, um, like Cricket could, but we know that um, that family and his lineage was there for a long time at, at, at Star Gavin and harvesting. So it's kind of fun to just um, bring that back around. Oh, I forgot over in my favorite site, that one um, down there. Um, yes, this one. In the 80s, in this drainage here, they found a, a, a hammer stone. So we know there's lots of activity going on there. I mean, there's, there's stuff everywhere. It's just been developed a little bit. Yeah. So you guys are welcome to have a look at these. Well, Anna, where, where is that site? I, I don't recognize exactly. It looks like it is out HPR, really but where exactly is it? Right off the Halibut Point Road. It's a little below, there is a, there's a dock with, with um, mm -hmm. a machata boat. This is the Island View Lodge. Exactly, that's a lodge. Okay. It's, you go down, the driveway goes down. Okay. Anybody else have any uh, thoughts on this? I have yeah. a question, but I'm interested. Yeah, yeah. So, um, in your tables with the Yeah. You use a lot of marine organisms and charcoal, which comes with, uh, um, you know, sounds like fish was cooked. Uh, so what do you do about marine reservoir that they fossilize into that? We did do that. Okay. We did both, actually. Yeah, um, like your shell comes significantly yeah. older than everything else. And, that's and the well, the shell and is that marine. Can you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. She was asking about um, in our dating. So. Um, with uh, the marine reservoir effect, uh, there's a, a different component of carbon that comes up from the ocean. So when you have sites in, uh, in, in ocean uh, conditions, um, they use a different calculation. So there's a couple, um, this is just the original what they came up with, we've, we've calculated. 
So I think this one right here is our, uh, uh, there's my asterisk. So in my report, I made note of which one was the marine <laughs> and which one was it. Um, but what's fun about this, this is close to the same date as that we're staked down in um, Redfish Bay. Also, these dates are similar to uh, the dates that the Forest Service, you, some of you may remember when the Forest Service did that public archaeology project um, at Stargaven uh, over here with the gardens and everything. They dated their shell and it was around 600. So this whole area, and of course, um, uh, some people have talked about some clam gardens up in front of here. This is just one amazing area. It still is. But um, yeah, I'd like to do more studies on the, the charcoal dates that we got um, over here and comparing it to the, the, what the Forest Service got in the 80s um, up in there. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Our marine calculation and then our regular calculation. We did do both, and I think that's what those dates were. Pardon? For the weir state? The for the area? Yeah. Uh, for the stake itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep. We used uh, the direct. Uh, AMS down in uh, Washington State to do our, our lab work. Anybody else have any questions or comments or? What is the rebound over 2,000 years in this area? I mean, you, you were saying basically the target would right. not move up tremendously. As much as, yeah, the so inner. Yeah, like, um, here we go. Uh, right here. Um, let's see, I think we've calculated so <coughs> five meters 32,000 years ago. Yeah, it is. The thing with Star Gap is relatively steep, so it would be. Right, that one wasn't. Whereas on Prince of Wales, it was a little much higher. Yeah, yeah, and Juno, it's even higher. Yes. Yeah. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm but this is just an amazing tool that has just brought so much to the practice and understanding, um, because and uh, the, for a long time the Forest Service wouldn't go above a hundred feet. Um, in doing their surveys, and now because of this modeling and this new um, new um, theories, they're finding so much stuff at upper elevations that's older. Yeah, but I will say, um, you know, I, I mentioned that you know the the sites were concentrated on Prince of Wales Island. Well, I had a project down there um, a couple years ago, and in a stretch of 20 miles of road. One end of the road, there was a site that was, uh, we found maybe, I think it was 10 sites, 10 new sites in 20 miles of road. On one end of the road, it went back to uh, 1,200 years. Way up there, we found obsidian microblades and, and hearths and whatnot. We had that dated, and it, it, it went up to 9,800. So that is a tremendous span of time. Um, and I really think that it's a, a, amazing populations that we really can't comprehend right now. Um, uh, you know, why aren't they, why, you know, what happened? Smallpox, all kinds of things, you know, movement in, yeah. So, you're, so the implication here too is that the, the ends of these stakes were driven into the estuaries or near into the mud and such. Oh yes, because of the the anaerobic conditions. Yeah, so you get and uh, like that uh, El Capitan site. There's not much on the top of them. You know that's all been er eroded down and and decayed, decayed. Um, but 
Yeah, we didn't remove any of the berms and, and do any digging, but um, yeah, the material just gets caught there and then you can just see where they were. They, it forms a natural outline from the tidal action going in and out and the sediments getting caught. Well, you would also, you know, if you think of five, you know, five or ten feet of rebound, um, mm -hmm. keep the straps working, you have to keep adding locks or yeah. actually moving the whole thing out the estuary. Yes. Right. Right. Like this that's, one. Because many of these only look like they're a foot or two high. Yeah. Like this one where we have yeah. this, uh, yeah, this weir down here. <coughs> right. And it is a uh, smaller rock, um, mm -hmm. not as sophisticated. Um, but I, I'm really into doing more research to find out if this is some sort of herring trap. Well, you see that with the, uh, like the Anastasia, which, where they had uplift and they had the, uh, it was hit, um, differential uplift, and they had to continually keep modifying their irrigation system because mm -hmm. they would spend all this massive amount of the irrigation system in the earthward tilt, and they had to go back and dig down and add to walls. And, yep, and yep. Yeah, there's a beautiful site in Ireland that continues to be, it's used today, but it's been used for thousands of years and they just replaced the, the stakes and yeah, it's really beautiful. Well, oh, yeah. We only yeah. have time for about one or two more questions. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Does the El Capitan uh, caves have anything to do with the, the stream that you're talking about? Because didn't they find a... Yeah. Going back to right. Years in there that is just up the 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 mountain a little bit more. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Could be. Yeah, Bob. I enjoyed this presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That means a lot. There's a place called. Right below True Value. Mm -hmm. Beautiful river. It, it is clan owned and there's still oral histories about this place. Mm -hmm. And the rocks are still there. Mm -hmm. Three large circles of rocks, one below the other. So is that by the the uh, turnaround the right there and yeah. the skate park? Yeah. Because even further down, um, in front of a residence, I, I noticed on a really low tide, some yeah alignments going on there too. Kikushiin was connected to a clan house called Kikushiit, mm. and that was right there across from HPC. From Kikushi hit all the way out to, to the Kikushi Heen were all canoe haul outs. Oh, fun. That whole beach was completely covered with canoe haul outs. Mm -hmm. And Kikushi Heen was a place that fed <laughs> all the visitors and even myself, when I was a kid, I used to get cohos mm -hmm. out of those rocks. Yeah, it's a coho stream. And we used to go up the creek there, up where the present day elementary school, which is called Kikushihin. We used to get cohos up there. Yep, all the way and up there. Salmon. Mm. And dog salmon. And so. These oral histories still exist mm -hmm. within the families, and there's a what they call a provenance. I just wanted to mention provenance and how important it was to have cricket here. Yeah, I know. And cricket, where is he? <laughs> so I'm going to add my voice. 
Thank you. I, I support what you're saying, and everything was cool. But uh, these, these sites, the other place that's related to this, this site here is Hellebuck Point Rec area. It's a park today, but once it was a village site. Mm -hmm. That was also connected to the Kikushi Hin. And the reason why Hellebuck Point Rec was named Hellebuck Point was because there was a rock wall out there that looks just like a hell of it. And it's still there today, right there by Magic Island. And the other place I showed Park here is Cannon Island. Mm -hmm. There's a huge, huge clan garden that connects the island to the land. And these sites are undocumented and unprotected right now. And it's very difficult for me to talk about these places because I didn't, I didn't want people to know about them. But now I realize how important it is for you to know. Thank you. Otherwise, we're going that. to lose them. We almost lost Kikushi Hin. Mm -hmm. But those rocks are still there. And I, and I want, I would like to rebuild that place. All those, a lot of those rocks were moved, but you could see three big, large circles there. Mm -hmm today and and I caught cohos inside those rocks so I don't know what I'm trying to say it's just maybe maybe it's awesome. maybe I'm just offering a plinket voice mm -hmm. well I know in in some of my work I, I didn't uh, feel especially comfortable like sharing too much of the clinket oral history as, as my place but um, I do reference a lot of the work that Helen Dangle's done and, um, and the traditional ecological knowledge. And I mean, it's, it's really amazing that the conservation um, uh, principles that uh, the, the ancient peoples did use, like, uh, you know, picking out specific fish that, would, that had the certain oils and uh, knowing there's a, a story uh, it's from uh, down south, uh, not um, south, uh, southeast, um, that Steve Lang did collected um, about the, the philosophy of the fish are the best when they come in and, and kiss the, the river, the ocean fish, and when they get right there to the river, those are the best fish to get. Um, so they, they, it's, it's really beautiful, amazing um, conservation methods um, that we could apply today for sure. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, just allowing uh, a lot of fish go when, you know, we're done collecting, you know, making sure that these structures are set up so that they're, they're easily, you know, you can do that. Um, so it's pretty fun, and maybe the next time we'll talk a little bit more about that. And one more question. Yes, ma'am. I'd like just to refer back to your question about uh, clan gardens. The gentleman here just mentioned them. Yeah, first of all, that, that's uh, a concept that seems to be, uh, uh, there have been publications recently, something, not something I remember mm -hmm. hearing about uh, years ago. Yeah. So A, is it an accepted uh, fact of archaeology that they existed? And second oh, yeah. of all, have there actually been confirmed sites located here in southeastern Alaska. Most of the publications deal with areas in British Columbia. So two questions, mm -hmm. if you might, ma'am. Yeah, I don't know of a lot of clam garden documentation in southeast Alaska. Um, I don't think anybody's really made it a, a major study. I know that people do know of some. Um, but yes, a lot of work has been done in British Columbia on them. And it is More so. Yeah. Oh yes, 
Yes, it was a method of cultivation, um, you know, building the rock walls and then inside there it was, yeah, it was managed. Yeah. Yep, yep. The rock wall just um, allowed it to basically terrace it. Mm -hmm. it. It gave the plants a much, yeah. much a bigger area to live in. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. <coughs> Well, yeah. I'd like to thank Anne for your presentation oh, today. Okay, can we take one more question from Nancy? Okay, okay. Nancy, we have to honor Nancy, who's my one of my mentors. Thank you so much for this presentation today. Thank you. Opening up our fuller awareness locally to the richness and the density of population, the mm -hmm. resources, the range of resources. And now there's a lot of new information coming about the uplift and mm -hmm. the crust the, and the coastal stuff route yeah. is in now. Science August 11 has a cover saying coastal routes. Mm -hmm. And this would never have happened uh, until very recently. Well, and so that's the, it's, it's the Hillsuck nation too. They're really into the, the Trans-Pacific migration and, and the boat venturing too. Yeah. yeah I'm glad you brought some uh, stone. Everybody oh, yeah. I just wanted to share what we so pound in stakes with. <laughs> Or can we talk about these things? Yeah. How did the native people feel about Sam, uh, Robert Sam sharing? You know, that takes risk, takes and a little risk uh, a lot. to talk about this, and you're tough. And it seems like we can break some rules and learn all sorts of things from each other. So thank you, Anne. Thank you, Nance. Okay, thank you, everyone.